Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, in case you just joined, I would just want to remind everyone to keep your videos off and if you can keep yourself muted, um, that really helps keep the presentation running smoothly. And then if you have questions, please put them in the chat during the presentation. And if um, they are pretty simple questions, we can get them answered right away. Otherwise, we will wait till the end during our question answer period. So Franny, I think we can get started. Perfect. Uh, we just, we have a, about a 40 minute video that we're gonna play. And like Miranda said, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I am going to get started. importance of pollinators presentation. My name is Franny Jurdy. I'm the urban conservationist for the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District. And my name is Miranda Wagner and I am a district technician with the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District and I primarily work with the agricultural community. So tonight a little bit of overview of what we're going to talk about. First and foremost the importance of pollinators. Why do we need them? Um, then we're going to do an overview of pollinator diversity, the many different types of pollinators that we have. And then we're going to go into the threats to those uh, pollinators. And then uh, Franny and I are going to talk about habitat in both urban and rural communities and how we can incorporate habitat in all areas. And then lastly, Franny's going to go over plant selection. So the title of the presentation, what, what is the importance of pollinators? So if you look at the graphic on the right, this is from the University of Missouri. Um, this is a food web. And as you can see, there's a butterfly in that food web. And as we all know, there's more than just butterflies. There's also um, different types of wasps, uh, flies, many things that do pollinating services for us. And they are part of our food web. But we also know that pollinators are food for other animals, especially in their caterpillar or their larval state. So for example, 95% of North, of North American bird species rely on insects. And you can see that as um, it points out to the eagle. An eagle, for example, eats insects. And then a chickadee adult can feed its hatchlings up to 350 caterpillars a day. So when we have pollinator habitat, it's not just for things like butterflies, but it's also to have those uh, songbirds in our um, native communities. And then of course, part of the food web, which isn't quite represented, is the 85% of food production services that pollinators do for other animals. So when we think about omnivores, for example, like a bear um, that rely heavily on fruits and seeds and nuts, those services are provided by our pollinators. And then of course, there is us and pollinators provide about $29 billion worth of services for our US crops. And we oftentimes only hear about honeybees, Europe, European honeybees being brought in, brought in to do these things for us. But our, our native bees and other insects also provide these services. For example, um, fig or figs are only pollinated by fig wasps. So speaking of wasps, um, there are a lot of different kinds of pollinators that we rely on for all of those services that Miranda just mentioned. So we have, of course, we have butterflies. There's even flies and beetles, wasps, and then, of course, bees. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about bees because these are our most efficient pollinators. And they're the most efficient pollinators because they're the only pollinator that are actively collecting pollen because they use pollen to feed their young. They, they use the pollen because it has a really great protein source. And so obviously their bodies are very well adapted to collect all of the pollen so that uh, the bee on the top uh, left is a really great example of why their bodies are so great at collecting pollen, all those little fine hairs. 
and going in even closer to just see the diversity of, of bees. Um, this is a close up of bee tongues. So you can see all of these um, bees have different sizes of tongues. And so that's because they are specialized to pollinate different kinds of flowers um, to, you know, so flowers that might have uh, more tubular shapes will require a longer tongue than flowers that are a little more open and easier access that require that shorter tongue. And we have an example on the bottom middle of a moth and it's very long proboscis um, just to compare uh, the, the bee uh, tongue lengths. And so luckily for Minnesota, we have a really great um, selection of native plants that, that cater to these native bees and all of their specialties. So, you know, we have flowers like cardinal flower or wild columbine that have those tubular shapes that are really great for the long tongue bees. But then we have native sunflowers and black eyed Susans that are more open, that have uh, shorter um, flowers that are great for the short tongue bees. So when we're considering planting plans for pollinator habitat, we want to incorporate a wide variety of flowers to um, help provide um, floral resources for all these different kinds of pollinators that have these different specialties. And a great example of bee diversity are these two pictures here. They're bees that are found in Minnesota and found actually in Sherburne County. The first photo is a fairy bee. It's a pretty small bee, probably a little larger than the size of my pinky nail. And then in comparison, we have a common Eastern bumblebee, probably one of the most common bumblebees you see flying around. And that's probably even the size of my thumb. So very different size, but they're both on the same flower. This is a purple prairie clover. So some flowers are well adapted to accept many different kinds of bees, um, but it's still great to provide a wide variety for those special specialists. So now that we know a little bit more about the pollinators that we're trying to help, um, we're gonna kind of go into reasons why they are in decline. And it's becoming more well known that pollinators are in trouble from a couple different threats. Um, the first, probably most common reason are pesticides that impact pollinators, whether it's indirectly or directly. Um, so pesticides are sprayed on lawns to take care of you know, you know, um, grubs in the ground that are attacking lawn roots or bugs that'll actually feed on the grass itself. So this is a common sign you'll see, um, you know, springtime when um, pesticides are being applied. And then, of course, in our agricultural landscapes, we know that uh, insecticides are used on our crops, especially in a monoculture. It's very hard for those plant communities to fend off um, predators and pests. And oftentimes, a pest can decimate a crop very, very quickly um, because there, there aren't natural predators to um, help with that. So insecti insecticides can be used in that situation. And then of course, um, which has been all over the media lately, the, the use of neonicotinoids in seed treatment for uh, crops. And the seed treatment, although it's put on the seed, it can um, kind of be re released as dust during planting. And they're finding that this is um, having more effects on pollinators and getting into being more mobile than what they previously had thought it would be. And speaking of the neonicotinoids, um, not only are they used in an agricultural setting, but they are used in um, the, the commercial flower community. Um, especially on annuals. Um, they're treated to keep off pests like what's shown on this tag here. So when you're buying plants, you wanna be very aware of you know, the, the source that these plants are coming from, if they're coming from a different state and how they're treated beforehand. Because you know, if you're buying flowers to 
attract pollinators, you certainly don't want to have them treated with a chemical that could um, kill the pollinators. And a lot of garden centers are um, being a little more aware of this and are, they're reducing um, the amount of plants that are treated with these neonicotinoids. Another threat is development. Um, obviously that's directly taking away their habitat, um, taking away their foraging, taking away their nesting habitat. Um, so I have two comparison pictures here. They're the exact same spot um, in Minnesota. The first picture on the left is from the late 1930s. So you can see there's, um, there's some roads and maybe some agricultural fields, maybe a few houses scattered in there. But there's a lot of open land, a lot of woodland, probably a lot of prairie, a lot of wetlands. Um, and then the picture next door is actually just a Google um, snippet from this year. Uh, actually, it was probably 2020, but it's been transformed. There's housing developments. There's big parking lots, retail shops, um, and you know some parks. There is some green space, but a lot of that green space is most likely um, turf grass, or um, there's very low diversity in maybe the shrubs or flowers that are planted there. Um, and speaking of lawns, um, Americans love lawns, and you know they're great for you know recreating or gathering, having picnics. Um, but we we have an obsession with lawns. Uh, we have very big lawns, and they're actually the most irrigated irrigated single species in the entire country. So even more so than corn. Um, and it's a plant that we we don't utilize for anything. Um, we don't we don't eat it. Um, we don't feed it to anything else. Um, so a lot of resource resources go into maintaining lawns um, and they don't provide a whole lot, especially in the way of uh, pollinator habitat. And so talking about habitat, I, it's more than just providing flowers. We need to be thinking about nesting for these pollinators. And um, getting specifically into bees, they have very specific nesting requirements. And Minnesota alone has over 450 different types of native bees. So it's more than just the honeybee that we need to be concerned about. Um, and of our 450 species of bees, they kind of have three main categories of nesting that we need to be uh, considering. And so ground nesting is about 70% of our native bees. And then 30% are stem nesting and the remaining 1% are cavity nesters. And those are usually the, the social species like the bumblebee. So most of our native bees are solitary. So the ground nesting bees, this is kind of a, an example of what a ground nest looks like. It's just one bee, she'll create a tunnel and then she'll create little um, chambers um, off of the main tunnel and she'll take the pollen that she's collected and make what's called bee bread. And it's just a little uh, ball of pollen that she'll put in each chamber with an egg. And so that egg will grow into a larva and it'll feed off of that little bee bread until it grows into an adult. And so the stem nesting, very similar. Um, the bee will use either plant stems that are already hollow or plant stems that have more pithy stems that they can easily create their own channels. And they'll break off um, small sections to plant their, to um, lay their eggs and um, put their, their bee bread in there with them. Um, the top photo is uh, more of a, um, they're, they're, they're bee houses that you can buy most garden centers these days. So they're manufactured bee houses that have hollow stems of different sizes, usually bamboo, that you can hang up in your garden to help um, provide nesting habitat for stem nesting bees if you don't have that kind of habitat already in your yard. And then the picture below is a raspberry cane that was in my yard that some kind of stem nesting bee um, created a nest in there after I'd, I'd pruned off a, a branch. And then the last photo is of, of cavity nesting. And those uh, bees usually like to have 
pre-existing cavities. They can't create one on their own. So they'll use um, hollowed out, um, you know, pieces in stumps or their favorite is abandoned rodent nests because they're already um, kind of lined with uh, leaves and uh, fur uh, to keep them nice and warm. And so this uh, is a, an abandoned um, gopher mound that I noticed some bumblebees had taken over. So things to think about um, when providing habitat for all sorts of different kinds of bees. And so getting into more of like the garden aspect in, in urban lots, so smaller areas, I mean, you don't have to have, you know, really large lots to provide habitat. You can, you can start small. You can even incorporate into existing gardens. If you already have a pretty nice garden, um, but you have maybe some open space that you wanted to put something new, try using some native plants. Um, those are really great for our pollinators because that's what they have evolved with that has the most resources for them. You can also start a brand new garden and we'll go into a little bit of site prep for that uh, in a little bit, um, but you can start small. You can make it look formal by using mulch and edging um, and you can obviously expand upon it each year uh, and using a good mix of flowers and grasses and also trees and shrubs are really great sources of um, pollen and nectar in the early spring months. Um, so the first picture here is just a, a brand new garden to kind of show you an example of what that looks like from the beginning. And then the photo right next to it is a very well established um, pollinator garden. I think this is about six years old. So um, they, they fill in really nicely and have beautiful uh, flowers during the, the season. Um, and just a fun pollinator story. Uh, I planted a pollinator garden in my house shortly after I moved in. and uh, this New England aster, I, it wasn't in my um, planting plan, but there must have been a seed in a pot. And so it, it came on its own and I left it because they look beautiful. And every single day there was this kind of green sweat bee on the flower. And I had never seen that in my yard before. So it's, it's definitely as the saying goes, if you build it, they will come. Um, so just put out those, those pollinator plants and you'll help the pollinators. And it's just really fun to watch that progression. Um, so even if you don't necessarily have maybe the space to do a full on garden, but you wanna try to provide um, habitat for pollinators, you can utilize your existing lawn and convert it to a more bee friendly lawn. And that's just simply adding shorter growing um, ground cover flowers that'll help um, provide pollinating resources. So the U of M has actually created a bee lawn mix and it's not necessarily native species, but it's still better than just having, um, you know, single species grass in your lawn. So the mix usually has um, Dutch white clover, self heal and creeping thyme, and then a couple different species of grasses that are a little more um, drought tolerant um, than our, our Kentucky bluegrass, which is the typical turf grass um, that you'll see in lawns. But aside from those mixes, there's a lot of different native plants that are short growing or ground covers that you can incorporate into areas of your lawn that you might not utilize enough because um, usually these can't handle foot traffic like the, the U of M long mix can. So there's lots of different wild violets that can handle both sun and shade. Wild strawberries are a really great ground cover and they have these cute little white flowers and they actually develop into a small strawberry that are great for wildlife. And then we also have a couple of different kinds of native grasses that grow really short and that can be mowed infrequently um, to be maintained more like a lawn, like blue grandma and um, side oats grandma. And they're also really great for pollinators actually because um, they are host plants for butterflies, kind of like how the milkweed, the milkweed is a host plant to the monarch. So lots of options there as well. So shifting a little bit away from our urban landscapes more to our rural areas. So typically when I work with 
a landowner, we're looking at pieces of, of land that are greater than half an acre. And what I have highlighted below is what we see very often in Chirpin County, which is a 10 acre lot. Chirpin County has uh, many lots that are minimum of two and a half acres. And like this, this 10 acre lot, which used to be a corn soybean field. And at some point it wasn't worth um, the owner or the operator to continue cropping the system without irrigation. And you have a few choices when you have a, a piece of land this large. You can plant it to um, and introduce pasture mix. For example, you could have horses, cows, um, have a little homestead. You can plant it to turf grass, um, which would involve watering, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, other inputs as well, probably liming it. And then your third option um, could be installing native prairie. And one of the great things about prairie is that it is has adapted to the soil type um, that we have short dry grass prairie. So if you look over um, to the right picture, this is an area outlined called the Anoka Sand Plain. And you will notice that Sherburn County is entirely in this uh, area. And the Anoka Sand Plain is very sandy. Um, and the next picture is of the USDA textural triangle. And when we are doing soil samples, a lot of what we see is all the way in the bottom left hand side, which is our sands and our loamy sands. And honestly, when we start getting into our sandy loams, that's when we start getting into some of our wetland areas. So we are most typically dealing with these large lots that have very, very sandy soil, which means um, that it's hard to maintain moisture, um, number one. So if Franny was able to find this picture from Sherburn County, this is a typical large lot. Um, but if you look closely, you can see these tiny little dark green circles. And that is um, either the irrigation is too far apart or it's not working correctly, but the only areas of turf that are surviving are those that are directly being hit by water. And that's because our sandy soils have very, very low um, water holding capacity. They're low in organic matter. So when we're talking to landowners, that's why we bring up native prairie. So this was established, I'm guessing, about eight years ago on the same large lot, the 10 acre lot that I showed you in the first picture. And this is a short dry grass prairie. They have a small lawn that they do irrigate and manage as turf around their yard for their kids to play in. But then the rest of their property is this native short dry grass prairie. And there are a few ways to plant it. Um, I'm going to briefly go over uh, how we plant prairie um, at the district and the type of equipment that we have. So we have both a drill and a Vicon seeder. So our, our Truex drill is the top right picture. And this is what um, you would call a no-till grass drill. So it actually has three boxes on it, um, small, warm and cool season seed boxes. Um, when you purchase native seed, you will notice that grass seed is very, very fluffy and that the forb seed is very, very small. So sometimes it is a good idea to separate those out so that it's fed through the drill cor correctly. And then in the bottom right picture is our bicon seeder that we're actually using to plant cover crops and corn. Um, and that is a, a pendulum seeder or a broadcast seeder. So you put the seed in the hopper and it is spread out the back. And then we have a small Kubota 40 horsepower tractor. So uh, Franny's going to show us a couple videos. So the first picture, um, again, is our drill. So as you can see, it's going to lower, it's going to cut open some slits. Seed is going to drop down the tubes and then it's going to be closed. Um, by those packing wheels in the back. And that's David on the tractor. And then 
the our broadcast theater is um, you can see the hopper there, and that's going to feed down and then uh, be broadcast out the back in a uniform fashion as long as it's not too windy. And then we will go back in with our culty packer um, and press the seed into the ground after we broadcast it. And continuing on with different methods, site preparation is important whether it is a, a large site or a very small site. So we need to make sure that we have a firm, smooth seed bed, especially when we're working with bare soil. So the top right picture is actually from the University of Oklahoma. And as you can see, there is a footprint that is less than um, half an inch into the ground. And that is a very good example of what you want your site prep to look like when you're done. It's also very important to calibrate your equipment. Even if that equipment is yourself and a hand seeder, you need to know how much seed you're putting down um, so that you know that you're getting it put down uniformly and that you have the right rates. So with our Truex, which again is our drill, we actually um, take little Folgers coffee cans, we disconnect the tubes, we uh, spin one of the wheels, we collect seed, we weigh it, and we figure out how many pounds per acre we're actually using. It's not good enough to depend on the pre-settings on a drill, um, especially because we aren't seeding a single species. We're seeing a very diverse mix. And then with our Vicon, which is the broadcast seeder, we have boot trays, which we have stenciled out a square foot on, and we go over it with our broadcast seeder, um, and we count how many seeds are per square foot. This is also something you can do if you're hand seeding. Um, if you are calibrating your hand seeder, you can also use a method like boot trays to see how much seed you're putting out on the ground. And of course, you'd have to be walking um, about the same speed the entire time. Another important factor is your seed mix. When we are working with landowners, both Franny and um, when I am, we are following the Natural Resources Conservation um, Services standards and specifications for our seed mixes. Um, and one of those things is the three species per bloom period to make sure that we have some sort of floral resource all year round. And then another piece of that is having a balanced seed mix. So we want to have um, no more than 60% grasses, but we do need to recognize the importance of grasses. There are many pollinators that use grasses in their larval or caterpillar state. So it's good to, to maintain a balance in your native prairie. And then when we're planting, we need to make sure we have seed to soil contact. That is how the seed is going to get moisture through the soil. So even if you're broadcasting, it's good to press it into the soil or if you're drilling it, getting it no more than a quarter inch into the soil. Um, because that is, again, how you're going to get water to your seed so that it can germinate. In a natural setting, we're not drilling seed, we're not packing seed, but what we do have is our um, freeze thaw action that happens every year for us with our snow melts. And we also would have hoof action or we would have burrowing action that would help bring that soil um, or that seed down into the soil. And then the last piece for planting is patience and maintenance, um, and sometimes a lot of patience. So when we go into uh, planting, let's say turf grass, um, especially if we're doing sod, we have a pretty quick establishment. Um, it's bare ground, and then within either a month or so, you have something growing, and it's satisfying. Prairie is a little bit of a different story. Um, we often say the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. So when we're doing spring seeding, the first season it is going to sleep um, as, it, as it germinates, as it establishes, and um, some seed requires that first year of uh, freezing or scarification to help break, over that, break open that seed. And then the second year, 
some species will start coming up. And then the third year, you're really going to see that diversity coming into your prairie. And no matter what year you are in your establishment, maintenance is very important. Um, especially if you have things like Siberian elms or red cedars, those will outcompete your prairie. But also things like Canada thistle um, or reed canary also need to be um, watched. And um, even ragweed, we've seen issues with an entire field turning into ragweed if we're not careful. And normally with a prairie, there's some sort of dis disturbance every four to six years. So we often often suggest people do something like a mowing or a burn, but not doing the same thing every year because in a natural setting, um, it wouldn't be always burned or it wouldn't always be grazed and it wouldn't always be in the spring and it wouldn't always be in the fall. So mixing that up so that it favors different species every time that you're doing maintenance. And then the big why, why are we so, I don't wanna say pushy about native prairie, but why do we talk about it so much? Um, the first piece we've already covered, the habitat. Again, not just for bees, um, but also our butterflies and the things that eat the bees and the butterflies. So our songbirds, um, our game birds, and then soil erosion. When we think of Sherburne County, um, some people don't even call it sand, they call it blow sand because you'll notice that in the spring, there is a lot of wind erosion carrying our soil away. And prairie is a great way to stop that type of erosion. And then the last two things, water quality and water storage kind of go hand in hand. So we always have a living root in the soil. We are using water, we are filtering water, and we are storing water in the soil profile, which helps mitigate um, uh, flooding and it helps uh, mitigate um, water, you know, moving too fast through our soil profile. And it also helps it being uh, used on the landscape. So another big reason why um, we encourage people to do prairie versus lawn is cost. Um, the upfront cost of native prairie might be a little more than grass, typically because native seed is very expensive because uh, how it is harvested versus, you know, single or just a handful of species of um, introduced grass like in K Kentucky bluegrass. But when you look down at kind of all of the maintenance over the years, it really adds up in a turf grass system because, you know, you need you need to mow regularly, you need to add fertilizer regularly, weed control, you need to water, sometimes you need to install a irrigation system where versus prairie, it's really the upfront cost. And then like Miranda mentioned, really every four to six years, you need to do some kind of maintenance. So it's, it's pretty low maintenance all those other years. And um, this comparison is, is over an acre um, for, uh, I think it's a 10 year period. So it does add up. Um, and so a little bit of the site prep considerations. Miranda mentioned how important site prep is and that goes for both um, small and large um, establishments. So the, the first three examples here are kind of the more, um, we would say organic type um, site prep. Uh, sheep mulching and solarization are both kind of smothering the existing vegetation with different materials. Sheep mulching, you can use um, kind of more organic materials that you could leave on site and they'll eventually break down. So cardboard or newspaper, things like that. And for both of them, you want to leave on the site, usually for a full growing season. Um, I've done sheep mulching where I'll put down cardboard in the fall and leave it over winter. And then come spring, usually it's ready for planting. So that's kind of a good way to maybe reduce the, the look of having that uh, on your property. Um, and I planted directly into the cardboard because it was um, broken down really nicely. Um, sod removal is obviously another um, easy way to, to plant um, pretty quickly. Uh, so there's different ways you can remove sod, both um, manually and maybe using some kind of uh, equipment. 
and then I'll let Miranda kind of cover the last bit there. Yeah, so herbicide is obviously another way to to prepare a site for prairie. And often when we work with a landowner, uh, they don't necessarily want to go the herbicide route, but we do suggest it when we need to do site prep very quickly um, because herbicide is can kind of be a one and done, um, get it ready to go, um, wait 10 days and then get it planted. Um, it's also sometimes necessary on sites where there are very hard to control species. And um, reed canary is a good example of that. You could do it without herbicide, but it would take much longer. Um, we've also done a prairie that had a, an issue with yellow nut sedge that it took um, quite a bit of herbicide treatment to get that under control. If you don't have good site prep, you will have less likely chances of having a successful project. So sometimes we do bring in herbicide. And then uh, the last thing that we didn't uh, put on the slide is doing a year of cover. Um, so especially in larger sites that used to be crop fields, um, doing a year of, let's say, oats, seeding it down and giving it one more year of weed seed to kind of germinate and then do a lot of active mowing to get rid of these weeds before they can make more seed. Um, and then also the cover crop will hold the soil in the meantime to prevent wind and water erosion. So then getting into some of the design considerations, um, Miranda already mentioned bloom periods, so it's really important to have some kind of flower blooming every season because uh, pollinators are emerging pretty early in the spring and a lot of them will um, stay active uh, late into the fall. Uh, we also wanna provide both nectar and pollen sources. So that's where we really think of getting a wide variety of different kinds of flowers. Also having um, host plants for um, caterpillars. So if you really wanna attract more butterflies, really want to have those host plants. And so like the milkweed is very important to the monarch, a lot of butterflies require very specific flowers just like that. Um, so you, you want to keep that in mind. Um, height is very important, especially when you're doing a smaller planting. Uh, you don't necessarily want a plant that gets six to seven feet tall in a small planting because the chances of it flopping over, uh, getting in the way of a a sidewalk or something um, are pretty high there. So um, you wanna really consider the height there. Also aggressiveness, mainly again for the smaller planting. Um, wild bergamot is an excellent pollinator plant. Um, bees love it, uh, so do butterflies. It is great for a prairie setting, but if you put it in a smaller planting, it is going to take over. Uh, so you just wanna keep those different um, species in mind that can get a little more aggressive. And then lastly, of course, just with any type of planting, moisture and also sun requirements, you wanna make sure you're putting the plant where it is going to thrive and it doesn't need a lot of extra inputs. And so plant selection, um, these are just, you know, three in each season drop in the bucket when it comes to the options that we have for um, planting. There's a wide variety of native plants at our beck and call at native nurseries. Um, so these are just a few examples to give you ideas of what is out there. And again, for each season, you really want to be cognizant of the type of habitat these flowers are accustomed to. So in the spring, the Virginia bluebell and wild geranium are really great early flowers, but they are shade loving. So you want to make sure they are in a more shady spot um, that they won't get a lot of direct sunlight in the summer. Um, and then the summer variety of plants, you'll probably have a, a wider variety to choose from uh, just because a lot more plants tend to bloom uh, in the summer, but there's still a few options in the fall and you definitely want to include fall blooming plants for those late um, active pollinators. And this is really when goldenrod and asters um, tend to shine. And there's a lot of different varieties of both of those species for all sorts of different kinds of habitats.
And we're going to finish up with the community benefits of talking about pollinators. And one of the the great things that we have found is just the, the huge amount of education opportunities that there are for children and uh, truly believing in the importance of fostering that environmental stewardship very early in their lives. So we, we attend a lot of events. We try and go into schools and talk to children and school-age children about just pollinators and the importance of native habitats and prairie. Yeah, things like the, the refuge does their fall events every year. And then even when we're working with landowners, um, I really do suggest if they have children, even if they don't have children, going out and getting an easy to use ID book so that it can be a learning opportunity taking it out there and trying to find the different species that you have. Um, and then maybe graduating to trying to find the different pollinators that you have with, a, with another ID book. There's so many great opportunities there. And another great community benefit is um, beautification. I feel like native plants are kind of misunderstood in, in how they look. Um, but I mean, you've seen several examples in this presentation already, all of the different um, varieties of native plants that, that we have and we're lucky to have in Minnesota. Um, lots of different colors, different shapes, sizes. You can definitely find something um, to your liking when you're designing um, a garden. And then if you're into vegetable gardening, it's really great to include pollinator friendly plants to bring in those um, pollinators that are really good at pollinating because they will also pollinate your vegetables and they'll be more efficient at pollinating your vegetables than even the honeybee. Um, so it's if you if you want better tomatoes, it's really great to attract bumblebees because they are they're bigger and they 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 buzz pollinate. So you know when you hear a, a bee on a on a flower, you can kind of hear that buzzing action. It's shaking all of the pollen off of the flower onto itself. And so it'll bring the pollen to the next flower that it goes on. So it's really great for pollinating our vegetables. Um, and Miranda kind of already touched on the water quality aspect, but native plants have incredible root systems um, that help reduce stormwater runoff and control erosion. So soil isn't blowing around in the air and, and uh, moving off the land into our water bodies, creating um, mucky water. So great benefits there as well. Um, and so the last few slides are just a couple resources. You don't have to copy these down. They're pretty long web addresses. We can send these resources in a follow-up email um, with the webinar recording. Um, but just these are some resources where we got a lot of our information that we presented to you um, tonight, some different habitat guides. Um, the Minnesota Wildflowers has a really great online um, field guide if you're interested in kind of looking up more of our native plants. And the Minnesota DNR has a plant suppliers list. If you don't know where you can get a hold of native plants, um, they have a list um, for the entire state of the different nurseries that grow native plants. And then there's a lot of great books out there that you can get if you're interested in just learning more about pollinators and how you can incorporate pollinator habitat on your property. Um, so some great resources there as well. So that's all we have for you tonight. Um, so now we're going to um, have some time for questions. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the uh, chat window to see if there's been any questions. Um, and we can uh, answer those. Uh, if you have a question that maybe is a little longer and you wanna voice it out, feel free to unmute yourself and you can just ask it. That works as well. Brandy, there is a question. Um, what is good herbicide to use? Do you wanna answer that one? <laughs> um, 
Well, uh, so it, it depends on the situation. Yeah. Um, if, if we're just doing site prep um, and doing kind of just a get it all ready, then we'll usually use a glyphosate. Um, however, I'm going to let Franny go into some of the water safe um, caveats to that. Yeah, so um, glyphosate's kind of like a, a main ingredient in herbicides. It's what uh, is the main ingredient in Roundup. There's several different um, brand names, um, but there's uh, what's called a surfactant in glyphosate. It's like a, an oil that helps adhere the herbicide to the plant. And that is pretty toxic to uh, aquatic organisms. So if you're doing a planting that's closer to a water body, like a river or lake or wetland, you want to buy something that doesn't have that surfactant in it. And so there are water safe herbicides um, that have glyphosate just that take out that surfactant. Um, and so th they're, they have several different brand names. There's Aquanet and um, Rodeo. Uh, things like that. So it's just just something to to keep in mind. But um, yeah, like Miranda said, that's typically what we use is just glyphosate because when you're doing um, site prep, you you are you're targeting everything. Um, maybe if you were doing more like spot treating, you could kind of pick an herbicide that was maybe more more for broadleaf or more for for grasses and things like that. So there are, if you have a very specific pest issue, you may want to choose a grass only herbicide or a broadleaf only herbicide, but in most cases we're using a form of glyphosate. And then there's a 10 day window um, after you utilize glyphosate on your property before you should be doing any sort of planting. And then Franny, um, also, are there any grants available for creating pollinator gardens or areas in your yard? <laughs> yeah, and so there are a few options. So I'll go over a little bit and then Miranda can um, talk about her opportunity. So in Sherburne County, we uh, received a grant under the, the Lawns to Legumes program. If you haven't heard about that, uh, feel free to look it up after this. It was legislation that was passed in 2019 for pollinator habitat specifically in residential areas. And we were able to apply for that, but we had to specify a very specific location. So we had to pick like a neighborhood because they wanted this to be more of like a demonstration so people could um, go through neighborhoods and, and see all these different kinds of plantings. So our demonstration neighborhood where you can um, get funding for pollinator habitat is kind of around the Big Eagle Lake community in uh, Oroch Township. Um, and so if you live in that area, then you're in luck. We have uh, funding for you. But if not, we also just kind of created a new program this year for very similar type, uh, small pollinator plantings um, throughout the whole county. We have a, a small reimbursement that we're, we're offering for that but Miranda can talk about um, something for Prairie as well. Yeah, so if we are working with a property owner that has half an acre or larger that they want to convert to Prairie, then we have our, um, our native habitat program that we can utilize and that offers some cost sharing for seed. Um, up to 10 acres is what we can enroll on that. Um, if you have a much larger parcel that has cropping history. We also direct you to the Farm Service Agency for their CRP program, um, or otherwise there are some other federal opportunities as well. And that was the last question in the chat, but if anyone has further questions and you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Or if you are done for the evening, um, you can, have a great night, but if you have any follow-up questions, make sure that you copy down our email addresses or um, you can give us a call and Andy will direct you to either Franny or myself. <laughs>